How about no? So just count to five or? Yep, go ahead. Okay, um, good afternoon. It is my pleasure today to welcome Alio Shadeklova to the FIU Public Lecture Series. His talk is titled Contextual Interventions, featuring work produced together with his partner, both in life and professionally, Tina Gregorich, in their hometown, Ljubljana, Slovenia, since 2003. Uh, Deklova Gregorich has been an incredibly successful team, always operating uh, from the dynamism and creativity of a small office not to produce style or particular aesthetics, but to craft approaches to design that are micro-specific, either to the site, to the context, local materials, histories, experiences, light. Every project is an opportunity to find nuances, to escape the conventions of the normative, to challenge the obvious, as they say, not in a spectacular or overwhelming way, but through the subtleties of protecting wood with oil, exposing materials, referencing vernacular architecture, or through abstract concepts such as cinema, sociology, and science. The result of this process has won them numerous awards, competition, and has been disseminated in prominent design magazines. The list is long and you can uh, reference it on their website. Alyosha and Tina have also developed a critical perspective of tourism they call nanotourism, which uses the prefix nano to signal an acute attention to matter, the atomic, the molecular, transplant, uh, which is translated as a bottom-up engaged response to what has become a very superficial and shallow interest in cultures and environments. This line of work has been presented in the Bio 50 Biennial of Design with the highest award for that ex exhibitions in Milan, Vienna, Oslo. And this, this has also been the subject of um, visiting school of architecture and uh, at, of the visiting school at the Architecture Association in London. Uh, Deklava Gregoric has also uh, been the curatorial team for the Slovenian National Pavilion at the Venice Biennial in 2016 titled Home at Arsenale, which is a beautiful and habitable installation of wood and books um, as a curated library on notions of home and dwelling. And just to end, I had the pleasure and good fortune of meeting Alio Shantina at the University of Toronto in 2019, delighted to witness firsthand their fascination with understanding the particular dynamism of local building practices, property lines, codes, as they researched Toronto's neighborhoods, and moreover, how they taught their students to find opportunities for the extraordinary within the perfunctory and common constraints of housing. I also recall learning from them about the complexities of their youth as part of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and its breakup afterwards during the Cold War years, or the, the last of the Cold War years. The arbitrariness of imposed borders and attempts to define identity and culture through nationalism must have alerted them early on and how imperative it is to look deeply, to question and to free yourself, free architecture, free the built environment of the liminal subjugation of norms and prescripted styles. Uh, so I'll give the floor over to uh, Jose, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um... Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose Arroyo, and um, today I'll be introducing uh, Tina Gregorich. Uh, Tina Gregorich uh, studied at the Faculty of Architecture uh, at the University of Ljubljana and received a Master of Architecture degree with a distinction from the Architectural Association in London, UK in 2001. From 2002, to 2004, she was a uh, lecturer in architecture in the, uh, at the uh, <clears throat> EG, uh, IG, uh, UW. It was at the Technical University of Graz uh, in Austria. And since uh, 2014, she, uh, she is a full professor and head of the Department of, uh, for Building Theory and Design at the Institute of Architecture and Design at the University of Technology in Vienna, Austria. So now uh, we're gonna be moving along with uh, my colleague, Jennifer.
Jennifer, you're muted. Jennifer, can you hear us? You're you're on mute. Hello, can you hear me now? Sorry, it, it wouldn't let me unmute. So hello everyone, I'm Jennifer Hernandez and I'll be introducing Aliosa uh, de Gleva. So Aliosa de Gleva studied at, studied at the Faculty of Architecture, University of Ljubljana, Slovenia, and received a Master of Architecture degree with distinctions from Architectural Association, School of Architecture, London. Since 2014, he runs the experimental teaching and research program AA Nanotourism as a part of Visiting School at Architectural Association. The Gleva has taught at the University of Montreal, the University of Toronto, and the ENSA Paris Val de Sienne. Please welcome architect Aliosa de Gleva. Thank you. Um, well, uh, first of all, um, thank you very much, um, Elisa, for this uh, lovely invitation. It is my pleasure actually to, uh, to share our work with you and to eventually, I hope, discuss it uh, at the end. Um, and thank you very much also for these um, lovely introductions. Uh, so I guess we are ready to go. Uh, let me now share the screen. Right, I just found where Zoom went. Okay, everybody sees the screen? Okay. Perfect, yes. So the first thing I would be very happy to acknowledge International Women's Day. And since we are not live there together, which is extremely, uh, you know, kind of, I'm very sorry not to do that. So maybe uh, Elisa, next time we have to do something live, but, uh, and, and, and of course to, to kind of uh, enjoy uh, your presence um, and, uh, you know, give you uh, uh, my um, congratulations uh, and everything which is in order on such a day. This is at least I could do uh, with this bouquet of flowers. Um, so um, I hope this is uh, a good uh, kickoff. And uh, since, um, as you have heard in our introductions, um, I'm working with Tina, which is my partner in practically everything. So I can appreciate and acknowledge those synergies that uh, we kind of can create uh, together as, uh, as uh, in, in this kind of unity of uh, gender diversity, let's say. Um, so that's that's one thing, and and let's let's move on for for this uh, presentation. Um, contextual interventions is the title that actually comes up, or, or, or a combination of words which comes up quite a lot with, uh, in our work, because we uh, try to understand the world that we are intervening uh, with. So for uh, today's uh, presentation, um, I kind of uh, selected um, a couple of built works. Uh, I'm not going to show anything new, which is on our tables, because that would be probably a completely different uh, lecture. But I wanted to kind of devote uh, this time to discuss um, realized projects in in, in in physical environment and, and within the society. Um, and, um, and, and, and for that, I, I need to kind of uh, give you an introduction, which will um, kind of paint a picture of what is our context in which we uh, work, but also kind of a conclusion, uh, how we learn from those interventions who become part of those contexts that we are approaching with our work. So uh, first with introduction, we are relatively small architectural practice operating mostly locally, but uh, also a bit internationally with, with uh, some, uh, some buildings in the USA that I'm one of those I'm gonna show. Uh, and I like to think that everything we create is a reflection of who we are. 
So our cultural background, upbringing, education, uh, surrounding environment, all of these things accumulate through time in us and impact how we think and respond within the set of these specific conditions. So yes, to understand our current position is important uh, to also know our background and our context. So Ljubljana, uh, as Elisa, you've mentioned, uh, it's the center of Slovenia and Slovenia is a very small country uh, which is positioned on the crossroads of Europe in between East and West, but also in between North and South. So throughout the history, we were part of many diverse cultural and political contexts uh, from Venetian Republic to Napoleonic Illyrian provinces, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, Yugoslavia that you've mentioned, uh, which was this kind of political, political social construct, to be nowadays a country of uh, 2 million population, uh, independent country of Slovenia. And, and to give you a little bit of current context, uh, the Ukraine, uh, Ukraine is actually not so far away from where we live and work. And uh, we kind of experience that um, uh, tragedy in a way uh, quite intensely. Uh, well, first for maybe you know, being part of, of, uh, of European continent and, and uh, pretty much very much well linked to what's happening, but also from our personal experiences, because we have gained uh, our independence in uh, uh, 91. And uh, as Slovenians, we can understand how it is to live uh, uh, in an, uh, how to how important it is to actually maintain and gain and maintain uh, cultural, uh, political, and economic uh, independence for for a certain nation. So I'd like to express the support for uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, people, but also, of course, uh, support to all of those uh, Russians who stood up against their government's uh, actions. Um, so if I go back to, to, to Ljubljana and, uh, and, and discuss uh, what shapes us, is, is this kind of cultural milieu, whether it's kind of through history that accumulated around us, but also contemporary, uh, what you see on the screen is more or less the reach of five, five hours car drive that we can probably kind of do in a day or over a weekend. And you can see that we can reach from Florence, Milano, uh, Munich, but also Vienna. Vienna is commuting there almost on a weekly basis. Uh, but uh, through Budapest, uh, almost to Belgrade, and then uh, a big piece of Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean Sea and the Croatian archipelago. Um, which, which is a context that, um, that actually kind of uh, enriches us uh, uh, or enriched us through, through our life uh, where we are kind of spending it here. So although Slovenian territory is very small, uh, Slovenia is a very diverse country. Um, and uh, you can uh, span uh, more or less in an hour from... Uh, from an Alpine context to the Mediterranean uh, context where topography as well as the population character is dynamically changing. So in, in one of our interviews in the magazine Detail, the German magazine that kind of speaks a lot about how buildings are constructed and how they come to be, um, um, it's pointed out that uh, we strive to conceptually develop each project as a unique response to specific context, whether this is social, spatial, material, historical, typological, and so on. So therefore, as, as Elita mentioned, that, that we are not kind of developing a style, but rather a systematic approach. And uh, in a diagram, photo diagram like that, you can uh, quickly understand that our buildings, they pretty much differ in, uh, in appearance. Um, but uh, they always kind of relate to the same uh, process of trying to understand uh, the place where we are intervening, well, the context in, in a larger sense, and, and how to kind of um, work through that in order to create a building. So, so architecture in the first place is a process of thinking. 
and 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 uh, you know the, the sketch is the tool that we use to express our thoughts and to communicate between us, but also towards the our clients and public in order to to create uh, contextual architectures. Another very important topic uh, it is the user. Uh, from social housing to museums, we place users' experience and users' participation as our practice central, central objective. So the topics of new collectivity, sharing, collaboration, they all frame the social position of architecture that aims to stimulate specific user experience, but also trigger new social interactions. So we often speak about the user as our design tool. Another, uh, another thing which needs to be pointed out is that uh, we believe architecture is a discipline characterized by materials. In a great deal of context, I mean, the most uh, immediate uh, visible context it manifested uh, through materiality. So we try to kind of use those materials uh, and challenge uh, their properties um, and also their primary natures. But to, to, to also understand the architectural thought or, or approach, we, we also need to know a little bit about uh, architectural legacy. So this little section is kind of an, an insight on, on, on Slovenian, um, let's say, modern architecture. And the, the research um, of our architectural heritage uh, was present in our work since student years uh, on, because we were constantly researching it and it constantly was shaping also our practice. Um, so we understand our architectural legacy as knowledge base for architectural production. So here you see a little kind of genealogy tree from Joža Plečnik, which is for Slovenia, uh, an equivalent uh, is uh, Alva Alto for Finland, but then also his uh, pupil Edvard Raunikar, who went to uh, Corbusier to, to work in his studio, although he was a student, and then a series of his contemporaries, uh, but some students uh, who have participated uh, quite thoroughly uh, um, in, in shaping our environment in, uh, in 60s and 70s. And uh, most of those, or a few of those buildings were uh, also shown in uh, MoMA in New York, uh, I think two years ago, in the international exhibition uh, Concrete Utopia, which was covering uh, the, the modernist movement in, in, in Yugoslavia. So that's a national university library uh, that Joža Plečnik kind of uh, built. Uh, and it shows a reflection of Plečnik's own personality based on classic language, but also uh, influenced by local knowledge and resources. Um, and that's an example of uh, Edward Raunikar's uh, Plečnik student working also shortly with Luc Corbusier. He was a great thinker and teacher who developed the Ljubljana School of Architecture, as we also know it today, um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in a model that actually promoted uh, uh, architecture as a process of thinking. So here are the two towers in the center of Ljubljana with curtain wall facade. That is an allusion to textile um, uh, uncurtaining the windows. Um, and visible fixtures of the stone wall claddings are pretty much present. So that reverse refers uh, through Plechnik uh, back to another important figure in, 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 let's say, our context of architecture, which is uh, Otto Wagner, who was, who was teacher of Plechnik. Um, and, uh, and he, you know, all, you all know this building of post Sparkas in Vienna, uh, where Wagner was uh, even referring back to Gottfried Semper and uh, the, the theory of material exchange. So all of these things are kind of embedded in, in, in our knowledge and, and, and possibly they reflect in our work as well. So another few examples uh, are uh, Otto Njugovets. Um, here, a holiday home, uh, which uh, took prefabricated elements for infrastructure projects, uh, like trusses for a bridge, that doubled into a house uh, and created some kind of a, 
uh, well, uh, shape for individual living. And so this, this would be kind of critical reg regionalism at its best. And then another uh, another example of Otto Jugovets a roof project protecting archaeological remains in the middle of the field using only rural traditional materials but with an inventive contemporary structure to provide minimal impact on, on the ground. Um, and uh, another one very important one Stanko Kristal uh, who was for a couple of years also my my professor when I was studying architecture um, who brought humanism in, 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 in Slovenian modernism. So that's a kindergarten kind of scaled and structured to fit the perception of, of the kids. But another example, uh, the last one I'm showing here today of, of our legacy uh, from Stanko Kristal, uh, where he kind of show, shown uh, uh, our, that, 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 um, that structure has quite a lot of authority within the narrative of buildings program. So yeah, uh, as I said, all of this project have been part of the recent exhibition Concrete Utopia. And what you're seeing on the screen is also an upcoming book that uh, Tina and uh, her colleague um, were, uh, well, are preparing now that it's a result of the exhibition that uh, we've also, also designed here again about showing uh, Kristen's work. So what we try to do is to, 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 to understand architectural approach from research by design to design by research. So, okay. Uh, and obviously, I mean, we are asking ourselves how to change, how to challenge the obvious and how to act beyond uh, the standard. So to go uh, with the interventions, I'm gonna start with a small um, compact karst house which we constructed um, um, on, on the Slovenian border to Italy, which is very much kind of Mediterranean uh, area and, uh, uh, and pretty much characterized by the karst uh, in, uh, environment. And, and, and those uh, villages that you can find in this area, they are very, co very compact um, and um, and our our building over here it was kind of part of this uh, of this environment. So traditionally in in, in Karst, as um, most of the oak trees were kind of cut down in, in, in the Venetian uh, um, um, Republic uh, time, uh, they were those oak trees were cut down in order to construct the city on the, on the sea. And so all those pillars. Uh, there are those oak trees from this region and some of the Dalmatia. And the land was kind of uh, stripped bare. Uh, the erosion kind of exposed to the stone, uh, which is limestone. And people had only uh, stone for their main uh, or only resource to build the houses. So those uh, traditional houses are kind of mini manifestos of monomateriality uh, of stone. And another very important characteristic, uh, local characteristic, is that all of those buildings, they were relatively small uh, because they kind of uh, fulfilled their main role to protect the inhabitant between, uh, from, from uh, the harsh uh, environment. Um, and yeah. So what we have um, uh, took as, a, as our contextual, let's say, reference it is this kind of typical karst uh, house uh, from the point of perspective of materiality, but also from the point of perspective of size. So we've imagined kind of a one room, one building uh, uh, type of concept where for the first sketches, it was kind of very romantic with just kind of an empty space with a few design items that provide light and that would be our ideal living but obviously you have to fulfill also certain other functions. So we um, filled in and packed this um, very archetypical volume of, uh, of uh, a double pitched roof house with small volumes inside to kind of create uh, uh, certain uh, additional levels of uh, privacy for these uh, people, for the users. So very simple floor plan, which kind of uh, provides transparency in one direction and distribution of program in the other direction. But in the section, uh, of course, it was important to, 
understand the whole space as, as one uh, entity, but uh, also this kind of private spaces, which it's uh, another kind of smaller scale um, uh, archetypical space, but pushed uh, up uh, uh, under the, the roof. So this is how the family actually lives here in this relatively uh, small um, area uh, or surface, which is uh, altogether 900 uh, square meters. That would equal to, uh, uh, well, 90 square meters would equal to 900 square feet, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that actually kind of live around this uh, around this um, structure uh, in the center of the house that actually provides um, provides you with a, with a warm material uh, wood and and as the surface is relatively small we have used different kind of tricks and approaches where these stairs actually double as a library for the little working space. But at the same time, they provide you kind of an ability to go up and to, um, to inhabit this uh, shared space in between the two little bedrooms uh, where um, the kids, well, it started with one, there are two now, can uh, enjoy the whole space of the house. But at the same time, uh, they can also kind of retreat to their kind of private mini house within the house in order to to, to, to sleep or to have some privacy. So when you're kind of entering the most private space, uh, you still have the same image of the archetypical building as you would kind of understand it from looking at it from the outside. So the room in a way equals the house. Uh, materially, um, this is uh, kind of a ref referring to, to, to the typical karst house that I was showing. Uh, but uh, since the limestone, it is, um, it is um, in a way uh, uh, a scarce resource, specifically platy limestone, which those uh, traditional buildings were using for the rooftops. We had to invent different approaches in order to kind of uh, introduce tradition into modernity or, or contemporaneity. Um, so um, also in the context of, um, of being sustainable, we've used the cladding uh, with, for the cladding of the facade, the stone which we found on site, it was part of the excavation, with a very, sim very simple technique, simply to put um, a formwork from one side and then using concrete uh, to, 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 to fix uh, the stones, uh, which are not really worked on very kind of you know, high cultural level, but simply kind of um, extracted from earth and then uh, identified with a flat surface and put it against the, the formwork and then simply put in concrete, uh, pouring concrete in the back. And uh, this created um, that kind of appearance and, uh, you know, kind of very strong material um, uh, stand of, of, of this uh, building um, where where you have the idea that it's a stone house, but at the same time, it's not uh, very uh, uh, structural. So moving on to understand how the roof was done, because it's, uh, it was used traditionally from the platy limestone. And as I mentioned, this is a scarce material and it's kind of prohibited because it's protected now uh, to, to extract it from the earth. Uh, so we kind of took uh, um, on board uh, simple concrete slab and with some very simple kind of inventions of where exactly we put the the waterproofing membrane and how we use the concrete only to kind of be the cover for or protection for the waterproof membrane. We kind of mimicked the, the geometry of those, uh, uh, of those steps of, of the stone thickness in order to create uh, the same, uh, let's say, uh, physical condition of the rain kind of coming down on, 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 on uh, this surface. So we work very often with, uh, with uh, a lot of uh, samples on site. Uh, because if we approach to certain kind of uh, very simple low tech inventions, also the builders who are not used to do these things anymore, they are used to kind of buy finished products off shelf. Uh, they need to kind of learn with us on the on on the site how to do these relatively simple things, but quite different of what they are used to do uh, in, in normally. So in that sense, we kind of recreated the. In the, the, the idea and this materiality, which is referring to the context in order to present this 
as a contemporary uh, karst uh, house. So moving on uh, towards the insight on, of, of uh, uh, more, more continental, uh, this little house is already fitting in a completely different environment. So the villages here are not very kind of uh, dense and, and compact, but they're already scattered and uh, lined up uh, um, uh, along uh, the, main, uh, the main transportation routes. Um, so here the building technique is completely different and you notice it's not really far away from that uh, previous site which was uh, which was kind of all saturated with stone so here the additional building barn would be uh, constructed out of wood and clad with wooden uh, facade so we took uh, this materiality uh, context uh, as you see here this barn and uh, kind of uh, uh, repeats, let's say, simply materially in, in the new building. But at the same time, we took the most important uh, um, characteristic of the user, uh, which was uh, a wish to have a, a fire stove within the, the kitchen. Obviously, that fire stove is not something which is old, so it's, it's just an old principle, but a modern high-tech uh, element, uh, which can heat uh, warm water and all the other uh, things uh, which are uh, energy uh, um, efficient within the house. But on, on the other side, we had this uh, protected uh, 14th century uh, church, which we understood also as an archetypical element with double pitched roof, but with a specific addition, which is the tower. So in that sense, those two buildings, uh, they speak to each other um, in, in their kind of conversation of uh, spatial relationship. Um, so uh, in a way, the, the chimney, uh, which needed to be part of the central house informed the section of uh, this uh, building and in the same way as church became from generic volume to actually a specific um, uh, of specific shape, a specific product of a house. So they kind of communicate between each other, uh, but at the same time, they all uh, retain their own uh, material references. Uh, the church, uh, its own, is an, uh, is an example of, let's say, uh, high culture within the, 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 the context of the village and the house clad with the wood, which is kind of this um, um, ordinary culture of building um, uh, uh, homes and, and, and service buildings within the village. So um, that's uh, a manifestation of, uh, of uh, the facade where we kind of hit all the frames of the window. So it remains this kind of a service uh, look because it's also relatively uh, small. Uh, and in the terms of organization of the, of the functions, uh, it is the chimney, the central element, which kind of protrudes through the house. But we pushed all the other, uh, the other elements that such a building needs to have on the perimeter walls. So uh, the, the thickness of the perimeter wall, it actually uh, contains the basic structure, protection, thermal insulation, but also all of the storage. So the walls are relatively thick and they kind of create a transition space between the inside and the outside. Materially, as, um, as the roof doesn't kind of end up on the ridge, but it creates another volume on top, we uh, clad that kind of uniformly with, uh, with uh, wood to have a um, a continuous uh, material uh, surface throughout the outside. So the window is always kind of a, a touch of, of the inside to, towards the outside. So we carefully uh, positioned uh, the main windows which uh, relate openly to, the, to their uh, immediate environment. But at the same time, all the other windows are uh, in a way only niches which uh, curate specific views from, uh, for, for the users to actually observe the church and the, 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 the landscape uh, or the interest points in the landscape around the building. But at the same time on the inside, 
it also creates uh, a deep space uh, where it can be like uh, inhabitable niches. Uh, so the space is actually floating around uh, this main uh, main uh, element of a chimney where to which uh, the 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 stove kitchen is is attached that is actually producing the the, the energetic part of the building but also the social part of the building where where people actually socialize and they kind of cook together uh, with the family um, the chimney kind of splits the, the the reach of the roof in two so we had the opportunity also to bring the skylight um, but uh, a skylight is actually flashing down uh, the, the light to the materials uh, inside the building where everything that you can touch with your hands and activity is a very important thing is out of wood but as soon as the material actually goes to the to the roof where it has to be kind of a structurally very very sound roof because it's actually a truss in the longitudinal way we just kind of replace the memory of uh, of wooden planks uh, that are imprinted in in the concrete uh, so you have the memory of the material being wrapped around but manifested in different in, in, in different material, in a way, referencing back to Gottfried Semper, as I was mentioning in the introduction. So when your gaze goes up, then you kind of uh, um, reconnect yourself with the nature or the sky or the universe, if you want. So we are going to kind of uh, jump like uh, on the other side of the world. So this is a clifftop house in uh, Maui. We had the opportunity to actually work there. Um, Hawaii are very special, uh, obviously. I mean, contextually, this is something completely different. Um, and that's a location on the north shore of Hawaii. And uh, our client is somewhat special because he he's half Slovenian, half Croatian, but he moved to Maui because his job was to design uh, a windsurfing sails. Um, and Maui is the perfect place where uh, you can uh, test those sales uh, on a daily basis. And Neil Pride, as a global um, company, had the research department there. So he, he moved there to, to head that research department. But at a certain point in time, he actually understood he wants to build here as well. So he found this kind of super uh, remote uh, place on, on the north shore of Maui. Um, and when, I mean, from European perspective, where you always kind of intervene in some kind of built uh, environment already defined and full of culture and context and so on and so on, it for us, it was kind of strange because we couldn't identify what the context is really here. So it was just kind of a 50% blue, 50% green. Uh, but living there on site, then you can uh, start understanding how, how, uh, how weather uh, and nature is actually very, very rich in, uh, in, 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 in inputs that is given to you in order to kind of create an uh, inhabitable environment. So we started uh, first with uh, understanding what is the orientation and obviously the, you know, the, the hill against the sea and what are the important views. But then we also started to work on how to, uh, in a way, a bottom-up process of how to kind of enclose those individual spaces which are necessary for a person to be kind of protected from the environment and distribute those around that uh, little plot uh, and see the, the in-between spaces uh, uh, as something which is kind of semi-private, semi-public, semi, uh, as a floating uh, or, or fluid space uh, between those. Again, working with the orientation, what is facing where uh, we work throughout these different uh, models, um, trying to figure out how that space can be kind of covered and encapsulated, uh, simply to, 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 to come to, to a conclusion that those individual volumes have to, in a way, be uh, covered with uh, with some kind of a roof structure that uh, that it doesn't really kind of doubles the, the landscape, but it is acting as a landscape. Um, so in that sense, uh, you have that surface which kind of uh, underneath uh, contains inhabitable program, but on top of that, it's also kind of a, something that you can uh, access and, and and be connected with the nature. So it it. 
as it is a relatively big house and as you can imagine as Europeans they have a lot of visitors from Europe we designed this to be kind of doubling either a large home with all of these kind of uh, um, individual rooms but it could also kind of turn and it does turn in a mini hotel quite often where each of the private volumes they perform as a suite uh, and suite room rooms where, where where actually families can be and and they this they, they, they spend the space in between for for socializing so that's a distribution of the, the floor plan or the kind of drawn and uh, and the big roof which actually actually doubles the space of uh, the, the space which is which is coming kind of closed underneath the roof is double in size in order to provide uh, protection from sun and from uh, winds so materially, the roof it presents as itself as, as an object on, on, on its own, uh, clad with uh, with this um, uh, ipe wood. Uh, but it's also important to understand that there are, that the whole building is absolutely free of any uh, technological or mechanical um, appliances which would ventilate or or or, or cool uh, the space. But it, it only kind of um, uh, relies on natural uh, forces and uh, having cross ventilations, allowing the trade winds, winds to actually go through, it is an important part of uh, maintaining the inhabitable climate. Uh, it is a building that doesn't really have a facade uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's simply kind of this deep transition between inside and outside, um, but it frames the views from uh, from from the position of where, as a user, you are inhabiting this house, um, and and these kind of large cantilevered roofs, they mediate this kind of transition when you uh, are either retrieving from from the nature into your private environment or kind of doing the the opposite uh, transition. Um, what was uh, really important for us in terms of building techniques um, as we were confronted that uh, that um, uh, American American technology of building houses mostly uh, relies on uh, frame wooden structures, but uh, our client kind of wanted a solid house, which is uh, from the perspective back then it was kind of understandable. Uh, we kind of constructed these walls out of uh, concrete uh, bricks, simply filled with, uh, with, with the concrete, so avoiding any formworks, which was kind of pricey. But uh, what we uh, wanted to, to add to, to the building is to bring their immediate, well, their kind of Hawaiian context into their home. So we used the mortar, which is uh, which is uh, which has a great uh, which has a, kind of a lot of amount of of uh, of, a, of a beach sand uh, integrated. Uh, so what you are used to see when you are driving uh, around Maui uh, with all of the sandy beaches, then you're also kind of having at home within uh, your environment. Um, the other experiment we did is that we used the the ipe wood, which is those are the local trees from from Maui and uh, in that sense they are fit for the environment but we kind of uh, uh, use them in an untreated way simply just kind of oiled and it was interesting to well to, to, to see and follow how that material ages and weather is completely different whether it's kind of protected from from uh, um, the forces of the nature or it's exposed to the forces of the nature so in a way um, with with this roof uh, we uh, maybe unconsciously but now seeing uh, in the in the hindsight uh, created very similar uh, chromatic structure to what you see uh, on the stone cliffs there are again two completely different materials but under the same weather they become somehow uh, part of the same environment and unified. So in that sense, the Maui building, it's kind of embedded into this, uh, into this environment uh, through material uh, properties. So if I'm moving back to, to Europe, uh, it's and maybe moving up in scale, that's a housing uh, in, a, in a different environment already 
pretty much inland uh, on uh, and, and actually on the uh, on the first footsteps of the Alps, uh, where where in this kind of setting uh, the the site had this kind of view. So that's a straightforward uh, alpine environment, the one that you can imagine from the tourist brochures from Switzerland or, 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 or Austria. Um, and obviously it is a completely different uh, situation that you have to kind of uh, understand and, and intervene. So it, it is a commercial project. Uh, it was a commission of uh, already kind of subdivided uh, lots uh, and with uh, pretty much determined uh, urban um, or, or let's say, uh, yeah, the urban rules of uh, how uh, the house can be sh shaped and how it can be, uh, uh, what kind of size it, it has to have. So uh, what we uh, managed to, to propose is to kind of uh, to, to shift those volumes so everybody can have the view towards the mountains uh, and to have a repetitive structure which uh, slightly kind of changes uh, uh, its, um, it, it, its kind of a twin house, but it slightly changes the floor plan in order to kind of provide uh, privacy on, on relatively small, as I mentioned, predefined lots. Um, as the client wanted to have, to have relatively uh, large amount of, of surface, of inhabitable surface, we uh, propose to kind of break down the volumes in two materials in order to, to, to smaller the scale, uh, more to fit the, the individual kind of human need. So you have a base and then you have kind of a, uh, a wooden uh, clad uh, volume on, on, on top of, uh, on top of the, the, um, the base. Um, so, in, in that sense, the, the whole material selection, including the roof cladding, is completely different because it relates to the alpine environment and it provides uh, also, uh, you know, kind of um, the conditions uh, with uh, snow. Um, in, in such a project uh, where it goes on the market, there is very little uh, maneuver to to actually do something with the interior, so it ended up again uh, just to you know to, to to allow us to think about how we can uh, go uh, one floor higher with this kind of stack. So uh, moving up in scale, this is a brick neighborhood uh, for affordable housing. It's not a social housing, but it's affordable housing. Slovenia has a national housing uh, fund. Which, uh, which pursues the idea of uh, building, uh, uh, yes, affordable uh, housing units for uh, the population. So that was a competition uh, which we were lucky to win. I think it was one of the first competitions we won um, on the outskirts of Ljubljana, that's the center of Ljubljana. And then this is uh, practically on the outskirts, but still as Ljubljana is a very small town, uh, pretty much manageable with a bicycle to, to come to the city center in uh, 25 minutes or something like that. Um, what was an important input for us when we were working on competition is that this was the site for the previous um, clay uh, factory, for the brick factory. It was the, the clay quarry and the original brick factory from which most of the, the, the housing blocks in Ljubljana from 60s and 70s were built. So um, another thing which was, uh, which was important to, to understand with this competition is that it was already pre-fixed urban planning. So we, we, we were kind of given with a prescribed volume and uh, a certain tolerance of how much we can actually interfere with this volume. So we, we understood that these are, uh, as a block of flats, they are kind of too big volumes for the human scale. So we try to break them down and structure them uh, into uh, um, in, into something that can relate to individual person who is going to uh, live in those um, in those apartments. Um, very uh, importantly, we also proposed, as this was not asked in the brief, we proposed um, shared spaces, and that refers also to our to our master thesis at the Architectural Association in London, where we were looking at how collective housing can work differently, more socially responsible, 
and within uh, within apartment buildings those shared spaces are something which are super important um, and uh, i mean we all know that uh, big uh, apartment blocks they have this kind of amenities idea uh, which uh, which in europe it's not such a present uh, 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 practice so that was something that we introduced here with this kind of sketches. So in the end, we were able to persuade the client, well, win the competition, persuade the client to, to keep that com com communal spaces, shared spaces, although it meant that a couple of flats less would be uh, constructed. But um, um, with soci sociological studies, uh, we understood that, uh, that the community can only be created uh, on a social level if uh, a certain limited number of of families are converging to one entrance and that number it's around 30 35 uh, families which kind of translates to 30 apartments so each of those entrances for those 30 plus apartments uh, had its own shared space which is working even today um, very actively for uh, either improvised uh, childcare or yoga uh, um, seminars or um, I don't know parties uh, as uh, apartments are relatively small as they are kind of affordable so it's good to have another bigger space for everybody to kind of book it and, and, and make a party and so so on so materially we uh, we kind of chose the, the 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 yellow brick because it directly related to the to the soil so as soon as the the builder started to kind of dig in the the the, the excavation pit the soil which which was the the factory was already not 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 not, not operational for quite some time the the, the brick factory but the soil was still speaking very clearly about the context of, uh, of the material that uh, this uh, neighborhood was constructed on. So um, in that sense, uh, as, as again, I'm repeating, it's not something that would, um, that would allow for any custom detailing. We, we took pretty much uh, a simple uh, uh, brick, standard brick, off shell brick, which, which has also this kind of element with a chamfered angle that we used not only for, well, not for corners, which it, it is kind of offered for, but we used it uh, within the surface of, uh, of the whole uh, brick wall in order to create certain uh, texture that can speak to you in a different way when you are uh, an observer from afar mm -hmm. or when you kind of approach closer to the, to the buildings you can understand in a completely different way and that's and that's our approach of understanding the the, the scale so how to kind of bring uh, the idea of scaling the the, the building towards uh, from let's say urban planning which is you know an abstract volume that is given to you as an architect to um, to the scale of a human being that actually can interact with the material surface with their own hands um, so the structuring of the building obviously uh, it's very seen that uh, the brick is something which is very much prescribed and it is an architecture let's say uh, uh, you know, given uh, or, or designed, which 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 has an identity, but whatever it's kind of in between, and we kind of uh, showed it with this uh, railing that goes up and down. It's something that actually is being inhabited through time uh, with people who are starting to live in, and uh, we don't mind people bringing their own uh, things there, showing their own identity, and, and thus contributing to how. The buildings uh, look through time and how they change through time in order to to have uh, to, to to gain their own uh, uh, flavor uh, and um, well they show uh, the identity of the people who are living in so um, moving from let's say collective housing or or individual spaces for for uh, habitation to to, to other programs, which here it's a metal recycling plant, which is an, an, an industry. And, and so often 
uh, the industrial buildings are not really uh, regarded as uh, something which would allow for architectural uh, ambition. But we had the opportunity to work uh, here uh, with somebody who understood that and gave us an opportunity to actually work ambitiously in terms of architecture for relatively common or maybe not so attractive program, which is an industrial plant of, uh, of uh, you know, change, uh, kind of converting rubbish into, into some other, some quality materials. So contextually, this is something completely um, stripped out of any uh, cultural uh, uh, context because it used to be one of the military bases, the ex-Yugoslavian military bases, which was abandoned. And it's in the middle of, uh, of, uh, of a green area. And it consists uh, programmatically of one a huge plateau where the waste materials are being processed and two very small buildings through which uh, the, the users uh, kind of uh, understand this process. So, those two buildings uh, we kind of designed uh, in a completely same uh, dimension, um, um, but with uh, two different material approach. Um, that's the sketch how the whole process is working. So it's a visitor coming in, going through this kind of control uh, building, and then seeing what is an input output, output in terms of the material, and then the recyc recycling. Uh, waste which kind of overgrew the, the architecture in a matter of minutes when it started to operate. Um, so one side, one, one little building is um, it's very uh, specific. So it hosts uh, offices that uh, are um, um, uh, very specific in terms of what, uh, what this recycling plan, plant is doing right now. But the other one is, uh, is in a way uh, hosting a generic program, which is simply kind of servicing uh, uh, all the people who are there with uh, laboratories in the garage where they can repair machinery. Uh, and we understood that, uh, that uh, one is being constantly changed and adapted to the uh, emerging technologies, but the other one relies to certain operations which are always the same. Um, so we represented one building in a 100% uh, percent metal structure from structure to cladding, but the other one out of concrete. So it's, uh, it's something that actually stays there and it, and it has its own uh, stability. So this is how it uh, looked like for, from the first day. Uh, they are both relatively kind of a, um, um, not very expressive volumes. But the, the one which uh, is hosting the, the, the ever-changing program is kind of being lit during the night. Uh, so you kind of see uh, the program happening. The other one is just kind of an extension of uh, the wall um, uh, of uh, this kind of a concrete box. So uh, those two, those two uh, buildings are, uh, are having their own, uh, their own individual stories and lives. So as the, the process of recycling of materials, or even as an industry can change and a completely different type of uh, production can uh, start to occupy this plateau, we imagine that this little building out of steel, and that's uh, was, uh, the idea of kind of picking up the steel, which is a material that can, that can be used in different cycles. We can understand that this can, go back to this in order to create uh, another cycle of, uh, of uh, a specific building that uh, is going to be needed there in future. So another uh, project, it's a university campus, it's a university building, uh, which again, um, it, was, it was erected uh, on the Mediterranean part of Slovenia next to the seaside. It was uh, a public competition, uh, they asked for a completely new um, uh, campus of a new university, which occupied, uh, occupied uh, a big empty lot uh, just on the edge of, the, of this coastal uh, town. So we were looking at uh, what, what are the qualities of, uh, of 
campuses around the world. So we understood this as a growing campus, uh, as a good example of a growing campus from uh, uh, um, from Kandilis, Josic, and Woods uh, from uh, Berlin. Uh, and uh, we kind of use that uh, idea of growing also in our urban uh, uh, an urban design because it was uh, it was a competition that kind of asked us to from from complete tabula rasa to understand how this campus can actually grow through time. So we divided it in uh, in, in headquarters, in dormitories, and in different faculties that can actually be constructed in phases, but also uh, be continued later on. Um, so that, that, that was the main uh, idea, but uh, at the same time, uh, campus in Europe is not something that is actually completely closed, uh, but it is something that actually uh, has to allow the city life to go through. So that was another important part. As it happens, we only kind of built first building um, and then the things went sideways. So in a way, uh, that building is now the representation and the anchor for a possible future developments. Um, but it is, uh, it is also kind of a represented, um, uh, well, as kind of a pied de terre of, of the campus on this, uh, in this area. So it is, it is a double slab building with a shared space in between where we have this kind of two entrances to allow the transparency through. And then the vertical communication in the, in the middle, uh, catering these two slabs on each side, um, with uh, with shared spaces for for offices and services uh, in the middle, where you can have a controlled access to each of the of of uh, of, of those uh, levels in in the, in the slabs, um, where uh, different departments are are how. Are, are actually placed. Um, the lecture halls are put in the in the basement for within two levels, uh, and this is the way how you can kind of go through uh, through the building as it kind of relates to this kind of urban uh, planning of having the campus transparent. Um, as it is Mediterranean. Uh, environment again uh, this building has very very small windows because it has to be protected against the sun uh, so it is it is uh, it is relatively uh, closed from from the, the lateral sides uh, with these windows which kind of protrude out and they start to look like to look or turn to the north um, so the, the direct sunlight sunlight is, that doesn't get uh, to the laboratories, but at the same time, the the split part in between this kind of a semi atrium condition has uh, has a glazed facade with these horizontal louvers in order to to uh, to have a very diffused uh, abundant light from the inside. So it kind of presents as a itself as a as a double faced uh, being. Again, protected from the inside, from the outside, but open to to the to the inside. Uh, with this kind of entrance, where uh, you go through the building and the main vertical hall with the staircase that connect all of the departments together. So one of the uh, super important thing for our, things for us was the education uh, has to be. Uh, transparent science has to be transparent. So we've designed 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 every uh, every lecture hall and um, and um, uh, office and uh, laboratory to be uh, closed with uh, with the glass on one side. Uh, so you get this uh, diffuse light, but at the same time you can communicate between different departments visually. Uh, which stimulates also then communication on professional level. Um, so this is how that actually looks like in uh, its operation uh, in laboratories with uh, this kind of quality of light and shared spaces where uh, students can actually socialize. Um, another thing was how to uh, represent the context from the inside. This is an artist, a friend of mine, who is whose work uh, is uh, focused on uh, 
taking uh, values of an ordinary object in, a, in an enormous repetition uh, in order to create a completely different value for the observer or the user. So we ask him to, to represent the context of, uh, of uh, uh, the program of the building. And as there are laboratories and they have to do something with measures. So he came up with the idea to collect different kinds of measures um, in that sense, like as a kid, that you would kind of with the graphite, you would uh, you would take the imprint of a, of a such a whether this is uh, on on a piece of glass or it's a tape measure or so we kind of collected different kind of measures, made collages out of those, and we cut those uh, those graphics in order to paste them on the on on the glass in order to create this um, this. Uh, transparency but also a bit of opacity to 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 mediate the, this communication from from a laboratory to the laboratory uh, with uh, the lecture halls uh, it was again quite important to actually take the local tree the same way as in Maui we were using the ipe wood here we are using the local pine tree uh, again, not kind of uh, covered with any other protection material, but uh, in a way raw, where you can even today walk into this lecture hall and still kind of smell um, uh, the, the pine tree, uh, which is really rich in, 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 uh, in, in, in its properties of, of uh, what kind of uh, smell it gives out. So the last project I'm going to show, it's uh, uh, maybe a bit kind of different and, 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 and uh, uh, away from, uh, from previous approaches. And that's uh, a cultural center of European space technologies that we have designed together with three other architectural offices, um, which is a kind of a complex process, but uh, I think it was quite a successful one, although uh, we were all uh, individual offices, but we came together in order to do a collaboration instead of a competition. Um, so that's a small town um, in the continental uh, part of Slovenia uh, called Vitanje. Um, and uh, um, the people of Vitanje have uh, gave the space of their existing uh, cultural center or community center uh, of, in order to kind of build this new uh, this new building. So that's that's how it how it uh, looks like. And uh, one might kind of ask uh, uh, how this is uh, contextual. But um, as you uh, understand, Vitania it has this kind of morphological, very clear situation where the church is on the little hill and it has like an absolute dominance. And also the society here, it's like relatively conservative. Uh, this uh, European Center for Space, uh, um, uh, for, for, for Space Culture represents on the other hand side, the, the, the um, science, uh, and it kind of represents the counterpart uh, to the church and religion, then we have also the, the science and technology. So why this building has even uh, come to be here? So this is uh, Herman Potocnik Nordung, uh, a Slovenian um, rocket engineer that lived in Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, he was, uh, employed in, 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 uh, in uh, Austro-Hungarian army, but uh, in ballistics, but he was also very uh, keen on understanding how people can actually start traveling in space. So he wrote, uh, he died very young, but he wrote a book which was called, which is called The Problem of Space Travel, the Rocket Motor. And that's, uh, that's almost now 100 years ago. And, uh, and this, is, um, this is apparently one of the first books, if not the first one, which starts to speak about how humans are, are going to travel in space, which Elon Musk is doing today, like uh, no time, how humans are going to travel in space 
from the perspective of uh, science and engineering as opposed to from the perspective of imagination where you have these uh, stories how people are uh, going to be put in, in, in cannons and then shoot into the space. So you have, um, besides the text, you have in this book 100 diagrams, sketches, um, uh, drawings, which, which describe from this uh, kind of technology of a rocket to understanding the, the orbits and the forces that can uh, uh, happen in, in the outer space to design architectures uh, uh, already kind of foreseeing the problem of, uh, of gravity or, or lack of gravity uh, and uh, how architecture has to change in order to accommodate life in outer space. Or for example, this is 100 years old uh, diagram of a heat pump uh, that would allow people to survive in the outer space. And the most important one, the one which is a reference also for our building, is this uh, uh, inhabitable wheel, which is a design for uh, a space station. So, so that's uh, a culturally very important uh, uh, moment and, and, uh, and heritage that we have, or context, if you want, uh, that relates to Hermann Potocnik Norden, whose ancestors were from Vitania. So here is this kind of connection uh, why this building and museum has uh, has been built um, there. But uh, Herman Potochnik, uh, well, he was kind of a obscure person, and but nevertheless, this book was pretty much known and it came to into the hands of Arthur C. Clarke. And from Arthur C. Clarke also to, to, to Stanley Kubrick, where they both kind of uh, did the, the screenplay of uh, of a 2001 Space uh, Odyssey, uh, which I'm sure you uh, all or most of you know uh, the movie and you know the, the well this uh, written work. Uh, so as they knew this uh, uh, book from Herman Potocnik Nordung, they took the idea of this kind of inhabitable wheel from that book to to actually uh, cater the, the the scenery of uh, this. Uh, well, very, you know, kind of present pop culture or yeah, culture movie. So going back to the story of, of the town, um, uh, that, that space, uh, as I was mentioning, they kind of demolished their uh, original community center uh, with the agreement that this building is going to also embed all the programs of the community center. So it's a hybrid building or two buildings in one uh, uh, covering the community center, but also uh, covering this kind of new program of uh, understanding the technology of space and travel and tribute to the work of Herman Potochnik Nordic. So in this kind of duality um, uh, towards the, the church and, and presenting the counterpart of the society, uh, it is something that uh, we kind of consciously positioned here within this uh, environment. So uh, another thing worth mentioning in order to understand this building as it's important for, for the last part of my presentation is that this institution uh, speaks about uh, space in a completely new way uh, of how uh, humanity has treated space up to now. So we can safely say, say that the space uh, was interested for the humanity mostly for two reasons. One was uh, military and the other one was commercial reason, right? With satellites and, and broadcasting. So uh, these people who are running this institution, they start to speak about the space as a cultural entity. So how to kind of bring together uh, uh, scientists who actually deal with space, but also uh, artists uh, in order to produce something which kind of uh, um, uh, occupies space in a new way. So it's a cultural entity. Um, so um, if I walk you through uh, this uh, round floor plan, the, the round hole in the middle, it is uh, mostly um, designated for local community as it replaces the, the, the old community center and the entrance where the local library is. 
So local community is part of this space and it's used for either installations, but also school events uh, and similar uh, um, interactions. And then we have the space which is wrapped around the main cylinder, which is an exhibition space, and it is inclined. It goes from ground floor to the first floor or second floor, as you would say, um, uh, an inclined surface where uh, the exhibition of uh, uh, space travels technologies is being shown since the day one. Uh, so this is how this looks like. And, uh, and, and, and here it's already a notion of a human body understanding the importance of gravity because the inclination of the floor is relatively big. Uh, so when we all speak, uh, when we all walk on, this, on, the, on the flat surfaces, we are subconsciously dealing with gravity and nobody really kind of uh, is aware about that. But as soon as the, the surface that you walk on starts to kind of incline, you uh, become aware consciously about uh, the, the, the problems you have to overcome because of gravity. Uh, and then another space, which is above the main uh, round hall, which is the space for the researchers, where this kind of a office is round, off, green, uh, round glass offices are distributed around for the, the researchers in residency or uh, workshops like that. And that's, uh, that's the Sunita Williams, an American uh, astronaut, which has Indian and uh, Slovenian uh, descendants. So she came to visit when this was uh, built. Uh, and then coming up uh, through the building on the roof where uh, from those kind of enclosed spaces, you uh, encounter again, the nature and the context where the building is built. Uh, and then you also kind of connect yourself to, to uh, surrounding uh, uh, hills with the greenery, uh, well, this kind of, full on the nature entity and the, the space. Um, to, in order to kind of go down from the building, uh, we have used the, the fire escape staircase, which is not simply functional, the, the fastest way down, but you are orbiting around the building in order to touch the ground. So this kind of complex section provides for that uh, type of uh, spatial relationships between different spaces and the light coming through, but also observing different uh, art um, installations and performances uh, from uh, unusual angles. So the building is in a way uh, being a social center, but at the same time also a, uh, a cultural institution. So learning from uh, this building, uh, we understood the following. So in a way, putting this uh, institution in, uh, in a town of eight or village of 800 inhabitants, it created a mini uh, Bilbao effect. So it was a lot, of, a lot of pressure of visitors coming there from the first year. Uh, that obviously in a, such a small community started to generate a completely different type of needs. So am I too long, Elisa? I'm okay, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go uh, quickly through the last part, which are student project. So we um, identified an open need and an exposed potential of Vitania to become a case study for a set of bottom-up strategies or prototypes uh, on how to challenge the, the, this kind of notion of tourism or notion of visiting places, but also notion of how we can learn from a building which, which it is a new entity in a, in a certain existing context, but at the same time with its presence, it creates a new context that has to work together with the old one. And it gives a new identity to the place that becomes the new context. So with all of these questions, we were, we were asking ourselves and we, uh, uh, I mean, we had the opportunity to, to, to start working. And the first uh, three years of, uh, of uh, AA uh, visiting school, which we called nanotourism, we kind of created within this building. So each consecutive year, 
we explored how the building actually works and lives with the local uh, community, but also with the society that comes to, to visit there. So tackling the, the, the tourism, we also were asking ourselves why tourism really matters. Uh, and uh, we understand that over decades, tourism has experienced continued growth, of course, to become one of the fastest growing economic sectors in the world. And uh, we were all surprised uh, in the economic crisis that the tourism didn't really make any, uh, you know, it didn't really uh, was influenced from the economic crisis, but it had like an abrupt stop through, uh, through the pandemic. And we are learning now also very quickly that after this abrupt stop, although it kind of uh, lasted for two years, tourism is taking on and there is little we have really learned uh, from how tourism can change through, through this experience, last experience, the pandemic that we have had. Uh, still, today, the business volume of tourism equals or even surpasses of, uh, of, of the industry of oil or, or of food or even automobile industry. Um, so we were, uh, uh, we were asking ourselves what is really important and, and, and uh, for the most widespread product of, of tourism is this mass tourism, which is, which is coming back right now as nothing has happened. And the model of mass tourism is always the same, regardless to local geographic, climatic, cultural, social specificities. Uh, in, in different places, you always find very similar or same model of, of, of mass tourism. And you can find it from uh, Côte d'Azur in France to the South American coastline. Um, and, and facing this obvious problem of mass tourism, we, we have remembered uh, American architect, innovator, and thinker Buckminster Fuller, who said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So with this in mind, we uh, came up with, uh, with a constructed term, uh, nanotourism that describes a creative critique to the current environmental, social, and economic downsides of conventional model tourism. And we see this as a participatory, local-oriented, bottom-up alternative. And, and, and we see it as, 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 a, as an ability to construct responsible experiences in a bottom-up process uh, and using local resources. And it, it, it's also important to say that maybe it's not about scale only, but it's a projected ability to consider these responsible experiences from the bottom up, but using local resources and depending on local contexts. Um, we also think that uh, tourism is maybe beyond tourism, uh, and it is more as an attitude to improve specific everyday environments and to open up new uh, local economies. Um, and I don't think we are speaking about something completely new, uh, absolutely not. I mean, these things are being done all over the world, uh, only if you think about agro-tourism, but uh, more and more often we can find cases and places where the word tourist is an insult. The term tourist is increasingly used pejoratively. Uh, which is implying this shared interest in, in cultures and, and uh, locations. Um, so the attitude is definitely not new, but giving a name to this uh, kind of uh, attitude and, and, and movement, it makes it stronger and we can discuss it and, and, and it can be much more present in, in, in our minds and society and uh, promote it for the better outcome for the, for the world. So we can say that nano tourism is, you know, critical, participatory, responsible, local, educative, inventive, site-specific, and so on, to the contrast of um, the, the 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 other things. Uh, and a nano tourism visiting school is a platform, one of the platforms that uh, I'm uh, heading, uh, which is a a school for teaching architecture through the perspective of what now tourism can be and how it can change how we visit and how we understand local places. 
So a quick word, uh, the AA is having this kind of visiting school program, which is distributed around the world. And maybe there are 50 to, to 60 programs every year running in different locations. It is mostly two weeks workshops, and that's the format also that we are having. And uh, throughout the last eight years, um, we created uh, each year with roughly 15 to 20 students, roughly four case studies per year. But uh, um, let me show you a few examples which uh, we kind of um, intervened within this uh, building of, of Xeo. So obviously one uh, uh, important topic to address was how Vitamia wanted to construct a hotel due to this uh, visit of uh, new people, but it didn't make sense. Uh, so we looked at uh, uh, at, at Xeut, the building, as an underused infrastructure that can actually uh, turn into a hotel. So the student group um, looked at what are uh, entities of a generic hotel and what is the entity of uh, the building that uh, we have designed and it was constructed. So uh, these differences are uh, pretty much clear and uh, obvious. But they also looked at, uh, at, um, at uh, conceptual context, which is you know, speaking about the outer earth, the, the outer space. And they asked our, uh, uh, ourselves, uh, what do we have in common on earth and outer space? And we understood that these are uh, human needs, which obviously is uh, you know, kind of eating and uh, sleeping and so on. Uh, and they looked in, 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 in uh, how people are actually performing sleeping. Um, and uh, sleeping on Earth and sleeping in outer space, they are completely different. On Earth, we rely on the interface, which we're calling the bed, and it's two-dimensional surface. But you see when the, when, when, when the interface is different, already the human position of the human body, it's completely different. Uh, and the human space, it's kind of, uh, gives completely different opportunities, how you move, how you position your body uh, within the zero gravity condition. So uh, the question was, uh, how do we start to understand zero gravity versus gravity, but also how do we start to understand two dimensional sleeping uh, as opposed to three dimensional sleeping, which was an, an idea introduced into this intervention. So how the zero gravity is, uh, is, is, can be manifested or shown or in, in, in the building or being an extension of that exhibition. So we understood uh, all of the, 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 the um, experiments with what human, human body is capable of in terms of ergonomics or movement, but we also uh, researched the ergonomics of the building of where exactly we can uh, inhabit it and, uh, and uh, uh, and see where the where people can sleep. So it uh, the project developed uh, twofold. So one was uh, with let's say the support of human body underneath with this kind of a prototypical uh, let's say uh, geometrical pillows. So the, the student group understood that uh, pyramidical pillow is something that actually can provide for different kind of landscape improvised mini landscapes uh, or bad landscapes. Uh, that uh, users can actually construct on their own on this inclined surface and provide for sleeping in the exhibition. But the other experiment was uh, on for, like technologically from the upper side. So how to suspend human body. And they started with this kind of simple prototypes, understanding the, the simple hammock, which was something that actually can induce you uh, 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 you know, can tackle gravity, but at the same time, uh, it doesn't allow you to uh, use all of your limbs or all your potential of moving your uh, your ergonomic body. So we, they translated one big hammock into uh, prototypes of many small hammocks in order to 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 make the leap of um, understanding that uh, the, the the multiplicity of small hammocks can be actually already embedded in such a uh, a full body suit that uh, engineered that was engineered how to kind of connect with uh, different uh, points with ropes and with a simple set of pulleys 
uh, the weights were combined to, to equal distribution in order to, to provide this kind of machinery that uh, uh, allowed for, for, for that, uh, um, uh, that kind of experience where you could uh, start understanding what is the zero gravity within gravity. So we call this a levitation suit, which was, uh, which was offering this experience and uh, that's Tina uh, pretending to sleep in the final presentation, uh, but also inducing this kind of uh, um, emotions. Um, we've published this for, for an PR release, and you see that uh, quite quickly as well, it was picked up by, by, um, by design and architectural websites, but very soon also with the lifestyle uh, websites. Uh, to the point where we started to get emails of, uh, of bookings. Uh, uh, so uh, this levitation suit was, uh, was exhibited uh, uh, around, that also Lisa you were mentioning um, uh, in the introduction, but nowadays you can go there and borrow it and experience it. So another basic need that we share is uh, that we have to kind of feed ourselves and uh, the student group uh, looked at what what is eating huh? uh, how eating is actually uh, span it's a span between feeding which is kind of just uh, fulfilling the nature needs to dining where uh, we kind of introduce uh, eating through culture um, so they researched uh, different kind of rituals of uh, of how humans are feeding ourselves but we also kind of teamed up with the local chef um, in, in, in the town, which was keen to collaborate in order to kind of create a specific uh, um, um, experience within the building. And uh, um, uh, how astronauts are eating is also very specific and special because it relates to zero gravity space. And you have this kind of experiences or in interactions between the human body and the food uh, that was also kind of brought into kind of consideration. And uh, we understood that all the dinnerware is actually not needed in this space, uh, but of course you need a napkin. So that was, that was something that it was translated uh, into this newly created experience of dining excel. So they've kind of created this uh, huge uh, extra large uh, napkins, uh, but abolished everything else. So they started with this kind of prototypes, understanding of also kind of blind tasting, how uh, the smell relates to the taste and, 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 and this kind of a simple prototypical machinery of uh, feeding yourself without actually uh, seeing the food, but uh, um, uh, only kind of tasting, uh, even with this kind of prototype where you cannot smell it, but so it's kind of reduction of, uh, of uh, experiments on the reductions of, of, uh, of uh, uh, sensory uh, understanding of humans. Uh, and, um, and the student group proposed to just kind of print the memory of, uh, of dinnerware onto the wall of uh, Xeut where you uh, don't use that uh, different tools, but you only have memory of it. So that's one of the first working prototypes of how you can consume food uh, with a gravity-free situation. And uh, it was developed within this kind of two weeks uh, workshop with the chef that he created actually a complete dish uh, of, uh, of an appetizer, soup, main dish, and, and a dessert. Uh, for the whole experience uh, of, of, of this in the final jury. So that's what you see there. It's a mushroom soup that was applied on the wall that was uh, later on uh, in the jury kind of consumed and, uh, and uh, promoted as a new experience as an extension of this exhibition of uh, space technologies with a locally produced sausage here, which also can uh, uh, stick out of the wall. Okay, so the, uh, another one, uh, it is if we feed ourselves, we also have to uh, drink. And the region where this building was uh, constructed is, um, has a very high culture of uh, wine tasting. So we again uh, teamed up with the local winery 
in order to understand a completely new uh, or to construct new experience that would uh, bring in the new context of Xer, speaking about uh, this uh, um, uh, technologies of outer space and the local culture of producing and tasting the wine. So the wine tasting uh, ritual was analyzed in this kind of eight uh, uh, um, phases from you know, showing the bottle to actually tasting the wine. But we also looked at uh, what are the spacesuits uh, that astronauts are using. Uh, and what it brings to the table when you start to move away from the traditional glass, which heavily depends on the gravity. If the gravity is removed, the glass is useless. So what kind of interface uh, we can have uh, in order to kind of substitute the glass. So different kind of prototypes, understanding uh, then the tube system, it has a certain sense for uh, for for the wine to kind of air, to mix with the air, which is one of those uh, uh, um, phases within the ritual of wine tasting. So different lengths of tubes uh, refer to different types of uh, wines because they have to kind of mix with the air different type of time. Um, and this uh, type of proposal of the suit where you have uh, your tube wrapped around your body uh, with all the kind of technical approach to it, with, uh, with all the attachments that uh, the wine can be. This is, let's say, uh, uh, a glass, an amount of a glass of a Cabernet Sauvignon, which is injected into your tube system. Uh, and then you have to kind of perform uh, the, the, the zero gravity dance. So you have to kind of introduce your body in order to move it, in order to kind of uh, run the wine through your uh, tube system in order to eventually air it very well and to have a sip uh, in, in, uh, in your mouth. So that's also something that uh, you can experience as the extension of the exhibition, but at the same time with in, 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 in a context with the local provider of uh, local wines. So the last one which I'm showing, uh, and it's, a, it's, it's, uh, it's an example of uh, understanding uh, how uh, the new context can create new rituals. Uh, and we call this project Don't Panic. So this group of students understood uh, in the first day that the Google the Google uh, Earth database didn't cover back then, that was the third year already when the building was built, didn't cover the, the, the new, let's say, portrait of, of the village or, or, or uh, uh, yeah, the, the aerial shot of the village with the new building. It still showed the old condition. So they thought this was an opportunity to uh, to, 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 to create a necessity to make a new shot, which is going to be an updated shot of the area that anyway, uh, Google does on a regular basis. But as this action is yet to be uh, uh, created, they saw an opportunity to also intervene with this action and to create a project, which would be uh, something that the local meets the planetary. So they, um, they wanted to actually create a message from Vitania to the outer space that it would be recorded with uh, Google Earth satellites into, and put into the database of the new image of, uh, of uh, Google Earth uh, imagery. So it was about, the whole project was about one snapshot and uh, one intervention on a larger scale, which kind of related to these references that you see on the screen. So the main question was what actually has to be or can be the message. So they turned back to this kind of cultural, um, cultural uh, relationship between uh, Nordung and uh, Stanley Kubrick together with Arthur C. Clarke. And they extended it to Douglas Adams who, uh, who wrote the, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, who said about uh, 
uh, who who uh, who wrote this uh, book uh, that has this kind of don't panic on the cover and it, it is one of the key words to survive in the in the outer space and uh, uh, Stanley uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke wait why did I yeah, Arthur C. Clarke, Clarke wrote at a certain point in time that Douglas Adams' use of don't panic was perhaps the best advice that could be given to humanity. So at any point, whether we are in a condition of facing the, uh, the pandemic, the global pandemic, or the World War III, uh, the don't panic message is it's quite in place. So in this kind of uh, cultural context, this project kind of took off, uh, uh, taking the biodegradable foil that was uh, there from local farmers and uh, using this biodegradable uh, foil in an action, in a, in a collective action where we invited uh, through different media, even radio, national and so on, people to participate, to come in and to help us to kind of construct uh, a big um, uh, inscription uh, in the local uh, hill over here, which says kind of don't panic. And then uh, we've called for the last day for the final jury, an airplane and a drone. As you see, there were, it was like a little bit too cloudy to have a shot from, uh, from the Google Earth satellite, but both the drone and the airplane, they made this kind of one shot the new portrait of Vitania, where the building is part of the new context of the village, but at the same time, uh, also the project kind of inserted this message to humanity or to, let's say, outer space, if you want. So that was the shot from the airplane. This is from the drone, which was then uh, fed to, 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 the, to, to the Google uh, uh, Earth from the user uh, user uh, uploaded uh, uh, site, um, and uh, you can actually find it there when you go uh, in the custom in the user images, uh, which is this kind of a uh, well, it's the drone image, but it's a kind of orthophotographic representation of Vitania with this new uh, message that uh, is is, uh, is is kind of generated out of the context. Uh, that Vitani represents today. Um, what we were scanning uh, after the final jury, we were scanning the image because it has a very high resolution. And we understood that some other human beings also took the opportunity in order to contextualize this action in their own way. And in that square, which is highlighted there, uh, the local kids had the birthday party and they knew about what our students were doing. So they subversively sent their own message in the outer space, which were obviously when you're 12, their own names. And that's also now part of the context of this project and of the message that Vitani is sending to the space. So uh, that's it for, for me uh, from today. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alyosha. Um, wonderful. We have a couple of questions from the moderators, and then we'll open that up to others. Uh, please also feel free to write in the chat. Yes, hello. So thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'll be I'll be asking the first question. So in yeah, introducing ideas out of the norm and having an audience that accepts uh, the, that accepts them is a challenge for any designer. How have you implemented participatory design action in your projects? And can it be used to overcome initial resistance to unconventional design? Um, well, I'm not really sure what you're asking. Yes, so ba basically, um, a lot of your projects, especially the nano, um, the nano tourisms, it's they're different, correct? So yeah, right. the regular us, we are not, you know, used to, especially a hotel, you know, that you go and sleep, let's say, with zero gravity. 
have you, were you able to perhaps ask several questions before, you know, that the program was established? How was it, you know, established that it was going to be a successful project, basically? Well, uh, I mean, specifically for this student's project, uh, I mean, nothing is really prepared. Uh, it is a very important part of architectural intervention uh, that you are able to know how to understand the topics at hand. So in a way, one of the one of the um, one of the messages that I'm trying to actually uh, give to the students is that they have to be able to kind of find the project on their own. So in a way, you, um, each condition that you are faced with has a certain identity, certain problematic, certain uh, uh, dynamic and so on. So it is an important uh, skill of an architect to be able to extract, to understand those, th those conditions, to extract the important parts of those conditions and to take the important um, decisions which are based on this understanding in order to create a project or a proposal which is contextually well embedded into what you are dealing with. So in that sense, uh, uh, yeah, this kind of participation uh, and action with participation is really important. Uh, and, uh, and I think it, it has a lot to do also with, uh, with ability of experimenting and with ability of not being afraid to fail in order to realize something that brings you to another level. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Yes, yes, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would like to ask you a, a, about a question about uh, nanotourism. So, um, so nanotourism based on, on, it's based like on collaboration among individuals and and to exchange knowledge and ideas and however like many people are not like interest in volunteer in voluntary exchange or or contributions have you found these ideas to be convincing even for uh, skeptics or, or is it more about like an offer that possible for possible for audience that are already like interest or open to like this idea hmm. Well, uh, I mean, there, there are two sides of, 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 of an answer of this question. Mm -hmm. So first one is that uh, I believe, and we have, we have uh, actually proven that with all of those uh, case studies, that a passive viewer or a passive visitor can be overturned into being an active one if you uh, are actually pressing right buttons or if you are constructing an experience uh, which, is, uh, which is kind of a tactile enough or interesting enough in order to extend uh, the experience or the extent expectations of a passive user or the, of a passive visitor. So I think architects have the power the creative power in order to construct those uh, those specific special experiences, which can be even extreme or challenging in order to change the passive user or the passive visitor into an active one. So that's one 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 part. And I think this is this is as a profession, as a profession of an architect, I think this is our skill. This is how we uh, we are uh, educated when we go through an architecture education that we possess, uh, let's say, the capacity of understanding um, what is the, the context and how we can extend this context with, a, um, uh, with a prog progressive ideas and with, with uh, uh, additions that can make that specific context better, but not alien. So if it's alien, it's 
it's it's it's to my opinion too far. It has to be integrated, but brought further. And and I, and, I, and I think it's I know it is it is it is possible to actually uh, change those uh, relationships that you uh, have asked with skepticism. So the other thing is that uh, obviously uh, people are different, and some people don't want to, uh, in a way, interact on a certain level. But uh, I think in terms of, uh, you know, kind of traveling and trying to understand new places, I think those, those people are actually not really kind of interacting with it. I mean, they are not uh, so often in this kind of conditions that it would, uh, that, 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 that it would be, um, in a way, uh, a problem of kind of creating this kind of link between the visitor and the, uh, let's say, the, the local person. Um, I see. Um, I have another uh, following question. Um, so this is regarding uh, about your work studio and your projects. So uh, I noticed there was a recurring uh, theme in some of the projects, which are about like, this like individual units that, that are connected and there's are, are like reconfigured into a, like a larger form. And I was wondering if, if you could elaborate, elaborate like a little bit more about this idea and what's like the, the design like process behind it. Mm -hmm. That's a good, good question. So, um... I mean, that's something which also has, uh, is appearing throughout history, um, that it relates to scale to a human body. I think architecture, it's something which is created for users, which we are humans and we have certain, uh, certain uh, properties that are, uh, are related to, to scale and abilities to physically interact with. And I mean, one of the most, uh, well, well, this kind of simple uh, examples from history, it's either the diagram of Le Corbusier of his uh, uh, modulor or, uh, or uh, uh, other people in history who were basing their diagrams on a human body. And I think answering to your question in our work, we always try to think how we can scale any type of building or architectural intervention, even if it's kind of an, an, open, uh, an open air space, how we can scale that, that it fits to a human body. Although it is a larger scale, simply physically, you know, because it has to be as, as, as a big building or as a big um, apartment block. Uh, it, it, it is an important uh, job of an architect to, to relate to something that uh, a person can uh, interact with. Uh, and, and that um, manifests itself on uh, simply, uh, you know, kind of shaping certain small objects, which is, uh, you know, the, the spoon with which you can eat the soup, to, uh, to your, uh, uh, I don't know, bad, as we saw in those uh, experimental student projects, to a room uh, that provides your, let's say, individual privacy that we saw in a small, uh, in a small house. Uh, um, and, and out of those kind of units, we are constructing our physical world that we live in. And, and yes, it relates to physical entities, and it also relates to uh, to emotional and psychological entities. So an enclosed space for one human body, it is maybe something the most necessary, uh, the, the most basic needs of, a, of, of, of one person, of one human. And out of that, we can uh, build on constructing other uh, uh, physical situations which allow us for socializing for manifestations, for uh, uh, bigger uh, events that uh, people as, as humans are kind of uh, creating. Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, it does. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any other comments or questions. Just be mindful that for the show, it's uh, 10 p.m. right now. So. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. I, you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I just want to congratulate you and Tina for your work, in particular, the first part, because um, I understood uh, the tradition in craftsmanship that is deeply anchored in architecture. And it shows again and often the difference between European architecture and the architecture here in the US, which does not have that kind of details and craftsmanship. And uh, it was really refreshing. I like that part very much. Congratulations. That's all I want to say. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, it, it, it is, uh, thank you, Thomas. I appreciate very much to, for you to noticing that. Uh, I didn't speak specifically about that, but I think it's, uh, uh, it, it, it is crucial uh, a difference, not only between continents, as you mentioned, but between different cultures and, and different, let's say, uh, economically developed worlds or less developed worlds. And I mean, from, from our perspective, we have certain ability and, and opportunity to still work uh, quite easily with a certain level of craftsmanship. But we are still, uh, I mean, we are already so much kind of saturated with all of the rules and, uh, and regulations that we are suffering in the world. And we look with admiration and a little bit of envy to Chilean architecture, for example, where you don't need to have a railing somewhere <laughs> and, 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 and similar things. And, and, and th those kind of crafted uh, buildings are being uh, you know, thrown into our architectural uh, media on daily basis. And, and we are admiring that kind of situations. But yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, OK, well, thank you. Um, anybody else? Or maybe it's yeah. a question. Hello? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, so this is regarding your housing projects. Uh, I, your projects are really practical. They look elegant, nice, clean, you know, lines and um, finishes. Um, they carry on an accent specifically on color. Um, could you elaborate, elaborate further on your interest in showcasing certain colors or, or specifically certain materials? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I thought I was kind of uh, speaking a little bit of, about that, and I, I, I think I understand what you're asking. So uh, I think uh, chromatism is something that it's not, it, it's not uh, related to a uh, decision of an architect uh, in terms of just simply speaking about the color. But I think, as I said, uh, architecture is a material discipline. So materials are giving the chromatism within projects. Um, and I think that's, that's quite important to understand. And if, if I can share with you, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if this is going to answer your project, but I, I'd like to share with you my experience as I was a student, because we were thought for, for my first part of education, I was going here to Ljubljana Faculty of Architecture, and then I did my master in, in London. So when we were thought here in, in our local school, we were thought by the people who were uh, in a way uh, modernists, who, who were taught by modernists, and they were mostly uh, acting in, let's say, postmodern period. And all of our uh, um, assignments or student work when I was a student, it was kind of a line drawing on a white background. So just shapes, no notion of any materials whatsoever. And, and this is how architecture was thought to us back then. We were kind of really strongly introduced into what is concept and the architecture has to be conceptual and so on. I'm not lamenting about the quality of the school. I think the school was good in, in terms of teaching the, the, the line of thought. 
But in terms of representation and in terms of uh, discussion, it was always materialless. Just kind of white modernism, if you want to sim oversimplify it. And I think it's only later on when we started to work on the building sites and getting our hands dirty, we understood that the materials are the one which are the crucial uh, elements that give quality to architectural decisions. And we understood that uh, even in our processes of thinking architecture, we have to force ourselves to start thinking materials right at the beginning, together with uh, constructing strong concepts. So since then we are, as I'm saying, uh, the, always the concept of uh, an architectural uh, project embeds also materiality right from the scratch. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's an important, that, that was my personal important lesson uh, through my career earlier, which I think it's very important to kind of teach forward to the students. And, and that's why I like to teach this kind of uh, a, a visiting school, because it's a format of a workshop where uh, you have to first identify uh, the, the conditions, then kind of brainstorm the concepts, and then kind of physically build things with your own hands. So students can have this one-to-one -one immediate uh, uh, experience with materials. Uh, and, and it's not even in this kind of three steps that I'm saying now, but this kind of three steps we're trying to run several times within, let's say, two weeks of a workshop where you kind of uh, understand something, have a creative idea, build a small prototype with your hands. And this action of building a prototype brings you so much information that you go back in the first, uh, uh, in the first step of understanding something to make another creative idea, which is already enriching, enriched with, with this understanding of the material in order to have a second better prototype, physical prototype. And if you are able to kind of run this kind of process a couple of times, then for sure at the end, you have a better proposal uh, that you can show to people. Yeah, that's fantastic. And thank you for shaping that towards pedagogy and, and, and your memories from school. I think that, that was great. I, I think we should wrap up because of time, but uh, thank you so much, Alyosha. It was fantastic. I've received comments from folks. Very grateful for your lecture and congratulations on the beautiful work. Um, so really, really grateful for this time with you. Thank you so much. Um, and, and, Hope to meet in person soon somewhere again. Yeah, th thank you, Elisa, for your invitation again. And it yep. was a pleasure to speak, although it's very, very difficult when you don't see the faces and then the yeah. time kind of, uh, it's an abstract. So I'm sorry if I was too long. No, but it was fascinating. I think everybody was, was very interested in all of it. So grateful. Thank you. And my regards to Tina, please uh, let her know that um, I said hello. Yes, uh, thanks so much. And, and she is uh, sending best regards uh, back to, to, to all of you as she wasn't really able to yeah. uh, join us and, and, and have this, uh, this kind of lecture in, in, uh, in a duet. In a duet, yeah. Next time. Okay, well, regards and um, till next time. Best. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Ciao. much. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye.